ownership, car ownership, education, all the different indicators of social class and suggested that the differential in quality and quantity of life was huge depending on where you were. And also that Britain had a fairly steep difference between the lower and the higher social classes compared with countries such as the Nordic countries, for example, which were used as a comparison at the time. And the recommendations from this report were that quite a lot of social restructuring needed to be done and uh, reconfiguration of funding. Interestingly, one of the many recommendations that was suggested was uh, free school lunches which we're still as you know we're still fighting for Jamie Oliver tried to do that and now Marcus Rashford has been trying to get free school lunches and this was recommended by Douglas Black's report in 1979 now what happened about with this report was that it was not what people wanted to hear in 1979 Margaret Thatcher's government did not want to hear this it was published on August Bank Holiday Monday and only 260 copies were printed this was how I first understood how information information can be suppressed if it's not concordant with the prevailing view. And then this was updated in 1988 by uh, Margaret Whitehead in something called the Health Divide. And this actually showed that these disparities were increasing. And this has been repeated in the Marmot and Aitchison reports. And we know that health inequalities are inextricably linked to socioeconomic gradients. This had a massive impact on me because it demonstrated to me at the time how marginal health care was on the health of the nation and it reminds me now and it's still this evidence has been repeated all over the world in many different countries in many different ways that actually healthcare can improve health but actually it isn't the only thing and that what we do as healthcare professionals is important but it's only part of a much bigger story and I think it's important that it helps us to remain I don't really want to use the word humble but to realise that actually you know the impact on people's health of what we do as healthcare professionals is important but it's not the only thing It reminds me of the day I met Julian Tudor Hart actually <laughs> I was about to say that. If only we had time for that story, Jamie. Yeah, the inverse care law. Well, you mentioned there's a book, The Health Gap. That's the one that Michael Marmot wrote, didn't it? Which I think was 2015. I've just Googled it. And I've never heard of the Black Report, but he's basically saying exactly the same thing you were saying in, that was in that paper 25 years later. Yeah. OK, well, I think the listeners might want to have a look at that. You, I was just Googling it myself as well, and the Health Foundation links to it as well. So we'll put that in the show notes. So three great picks... Thank you very much for those, Rachel. I was expecting them all to be really stellar, and they were. On to the micro discussion then, and we usually try and pick something that's relevant to whoever's on as the guest, particularly if there's some really difficult methodology to the paper that we've picked. So this is an opportunity also for me to get back in with the Australian listener. So this is another paper from the Australian stable, and it's also in the British Journal of clinical pharmacology. This is looking at a systematic review and meta-analysis potentially inappropriate prescribing and its associations with health-related and system-related outcomes in hospitalized older adults. Basically looking at all the studies that have ever been published between 91 and 2021. Lo and behold, what they found was that actually they're not able to conclusively draw the conclusion that you can reduce mortality or reduce hospital admission by trying to prevent potentially inappropriate use of medicines. In a nutshell, that's what it says. Rachel, did you have a look at this? I did. I would just like to respond to this paper on a range of levels. First, as an academic who's done systematic reviews and meta-analysis, I'd just like to say, wow, you've done a huge piece of work here. And any PhD student working in medicine safety is going to be so happy because they now don't have to do this uh, systematic review and meta-analysis because you've done it for them. So thank you very much. I've done quite a few systematic reviews and meta-analysis and I would just like to say that they're very hard work I think that's the politest way to put it so the fact that somebody else has done it in terms of what it finds I think that there are issues here and I'm sure that the authors would agree with me that for a start one thing they refer to mortality as a system outcome rather than the health outcome and I found that rather interesting because to me mortality seems to be the ultimate negative health outcome there's no coming back from mortality really depending on your religious persuasion they've also included cross-sectional studies. Now my experience of working in safety is that cross-sectional studies aren't much use because your data in terms of exposure to the drug that's going to be the problem and then your outcome from the problem is measured at the same time and actually what you need is a longitudinal study to look at the impact over time. So this has been prescribed now. Okay what happens in a year's time or in a week's time you know so you need a follow-up study so I wasn't sure about how they'd done that. And also one of the things that I wasn't sure that they had looked at was whether the studies themselves were 
empowered to find differences in outcomes. We do this ourselves. I'm the um, co-chief investigator on a large programme grant run by NOHR and we're looking at uh, the impact of prescribing events that are high risk on patient outcomes. You need a very, very, very large data set to link a prescribing event to mortality. And I am sure that most of these studies are not powered to find that difference. So if they didn't find a difference, does it mean that there isn't a difference or that the study wasn't sufficiently well designed in order to find a difference? So that's one of the comments I would make about this. That's pretty much what a lot of the studies that I've looked at in the past around polypharmacy and deprescribing is that, as you say, there's too many confounders and you need a huge sample to be able to prove that it actually reduces mortality. And even hospital admissions, some have shown it, haven't they? but others haven't, but they all say you probably can reduce medicines related admissions rather than admissions per se and emergency department. But, you know, we are all still scratching around and even the Cochrane review say, well, you know, how much evidence have we got for polypharmacy looking at deprescribing and using stop start? It, we're getting there, but we couldn't say that we had overwhelming evidence for what we're all saying that we should be doing, have, can we? I just have issues with the idea that we can homogenise the complexity of managing complex chronic health conditions with medicines into one process. So that would be your takeaway, if you like, for the listener. This is actually such a big effort that actually you're not surprised that they weren't able to because it's incredibly variable in the type of people that they use. I was going to say, and on that, one of the things they look at is falls, isn't it? And that is an area where that exactly what you said just applies is people often try and attribute a single cause to falls when they're doing research where we know that falls are the result of a whole sort of compendium I'm not sure the right word of issues leading up to that I think that's what you're saying isn't it is that but people try and break it down to if you stop benzofluoride you're going to stop a fall it's just not that simple I suppose just to flip it on its head then Rachel here's the killer question I think for all of us that are pro deprescribing medicines optimization etc you know shared decision making what matters to the patient here's the killer question do we need to prove that actually by doing this we reduce mortality i think mortality is the wrong outcome because 99 percent of what we do in healthcare does not affect mortality anyway you don't prescribe somebody an antihypertensive because you want to reduce their mortality you know that might be what you want to do eventually but actually what you're trying to do is reduce their blood pressure to reduce their risk of a stroke later on but uh, you know mortality is a very insensitive outcome measure 99 percent of what we do in healthcare does not affect mortality so therefore you need to think about your outcome measure you also need to think about what you want to do with the information that you're collecting you know what do you want to do with this what are you going to target from a study like this there's a huge wide range of medicines here and a huge wide range of indications how are you going to action this research should you not focus on a particular area i was going to say one of the interesting lines in it was that pip related pip was the term they used for potentially um, inappropriate prescribing yeah, yeah. Related adverse outcomes are preventable by amalgamating screening tools with practice measures such as medicines reconciliation and medication review. Isn't that what you're doing, Steve, in sort of primary care now? Isn't that what the role of the pharmacist in primary care is moving to? Things like pincer alongside medication review and medicines reconciliation. Yeah, and I should say for the listener, I've really probably undersold Rachel because if you didn't know, Rachel was the lead author on that massive clinical and economic burden of medication errors in the NHS that came out in 2020 and 2019 with huge numbers like 237 million medication errors thought to have occurred in England every year. So, you know, you really know what you're talking about. So I'm really glad to hear you say that because it feels that and I've taken part in a study doing what I do in primary care. And one of those things is, oh, what about mortality? It's like, well, we're never going to be able to prove that we've reduced mortality. But we all beat ourselves up about the fact that, oh, we need to you know, it's not good enough if we don't prove that. And it's that that we're not quite sure maybe. So I'm very pleased to hear that you've said that. I think it's important not to try to conflate everything into being such a simple problem with a simple solution. I mean, medicines are ubiquitous. They are the most common intervention in any healthcare system. In some healthcare systems, they're the only intervention. For some chronic conditions, they are the mainstay of management of that chronic condition. There are huge numbers of them, and there are huge ways, complexities and combinations of ways that they can be given. And the idea that you can do a study where you can look at all of that and all the studies that have looked at medicines and some subjective assessment of whether it was inappropriate or not, whether the medicine should have been given or not, and then measure whether that had an impact on mortality is simplifying an incredibly complex system. A big thank you to Rachel for joining us on the Oral Apothecary and for sharing her Desert Island drug, her career anthem 
and her book. Coming up next time, we'll be joined by Dr. Mark Porter. Mark is a general practitioner and an award-winning journalist. Mark has been the medical correspondent for The Times since 2009. He anchored Radio 4's flagship medical series Case Notes and Inside Health for the last two decades. We look forward to catching up with Mark next time on the oral apothecary. Over to Gimmo now for our contact details and the final ingredient. Okay, and thanks for me, Rachel. That was brilliant. So you can get in touch with us on Twitter at oral apothecary, and you can email us at oralapothecarypod at gmail.com. One thing you could do for us, if you're enjoying the show, I think it'll still be open by the time this goes out. You can vote for us in the British Podcast Awards. So if you go to the British Podcast Awards website, search up the oral apothecary. Be careful what you search for, because it does... The, the word the word oral does throw up a few interesting um, interesting podcasts, which I'm sure Steve will be listening to later. Yeah, um, of course. But, but yeah, um, search up the oral apothecary and vote for us. That would be fantastic. It'd be great to see uh, medicines related podcasts on the shortlist, however unlikely that might be. So yeah, the the final ingredient. I remember pigs in space on the Muppet Show. I got one better for you. It's worms in space. So worms are being sent into space for muscle loss research mission. Um, so thousands of worms have been launched into space as part of a mission to get to grips with muscle loss. The microscopic nematodes will blast off at Thursday this week from the US. But actually, the reason that's of interest, I think, to us is the hope is research could also help shed light on developing new treatments for muscular dystrophies, a group of inherited genetic conditions that gradually cause the muscles to weaken. And I guess space is one to watch for us, isn't it? Because much more research is going to be done into space, and I can foresee a time where pharmacists are starting to advise people on what they need to take on their trip to the moon. So yeah, worms in space. This was a Three Apothecaries production. Sound engineer, Jimbo Slough. Original music, Jamie Brewster. Artwork by David Baker. Thanks for listening to the Oral Apothecary Podcast. Warning, harmless if digested. This episode of the Oral Apothecary is sponsored by (laughs) jamiehayes.co.uk Thank you.